Right, I just got home from my daily activities. I had a quick shower and today we are gonna go to the Jaws Masterclass which is gonna take place at Harman in Northridge. Let's call an Uber. So, five minutes till the Uber arrives, so I have a little more time to talk about it. Yeah, this, this is gonna be a masterclass with uh, Joe's, uh, who is an EDM artist. I guess uh, some of you know him. And uh, to be honest, I'm not a diehard Joe's fan, I'm just uh, interested in uh, his production uh, tips and some of the plugins and stuff what he uses and uh, yeah I'm gonna try to record as much as I can hope I can enter so right now it's 5 p.m. exactly how I planned I'm arrived Harman Experience Center this is how this place called and uh, the event gonna start at 7 but I wanted to be there early they raised the entry limit uh, from uh, 75 to 150 so and then I talked to Val for a while virtual riot he's really cool dude oh yeah uh, he throws down man virtual he's like in, uh, made it a line is starting to form <laughs> Looks like we made it. Yeah. <laughs> Still an hour to go. Yeah, looks like we arrived. The restroom, please use it now. We're recording this. Do you have a little Wi Fi? Give it up for Jaws. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, just a couple things, and then I'll, I'll hand it over. Just uh, keep talking. You're good. <laughs> try to make your try to put all your phones on silent so we don't have any interruptions. Um, and you guys, when you came in, you entered your names into a raffle. So we're going to be giving away randomly three JBL 104 speaker sets, which is our new monitor speakers. So. Everybody who gave your name, you're entered in for that, so I'll make that announcement at the end. And if you didn't win, they're like 150 bucks, so just save some money and go buy some. They're awesome! Yeah, they're, they're really dope. This guy knows. He's... How many pairs do you have now? You've been to like everyone. I the one, but I should buy a second pair because they're fucking awesome. There you go. Um, and then, yeah, so it's going to be an hour, then we'll do half an hour Q&A, and then we'll have some pizza and a meet and greet. So, you guys ready? Yeah. Amazing. All right, take it away. What's up, everybody? Thanks for coming in. Uh, this is really cool. I haven't gotten to uh, do something like this yet, so I'm super stoked to be here. Um, as you're all aware, we're here for a JBL Masterclass featuring myself, Jaws. Um, like I said, I talk a lot. 
So I'm going to try to do it as quickly and as concisely as possible. But here's what we're going to go over. Who am I? That's pretty straightforward. A little bit about myself, early years, whatever. Um, and then there were three big points that I really wanted to touch on, which is how did you make it? Uh, the business side of things, and then just some stuff about music. Uh, but first, <laughs> who am I? I have a feeling if you're sitting here, you probably know who I am, but just for the internet, and you know, there might be some random people here who got dragged along by a friend who have no idea. Um, this is a couple of the things that I feel like are, you know, the things you would know me by the most. So on the, for you guys, it's on the left, uh, probably the two songs at the beginning of my career. Oh yeah, I should probably say, my name is Sam. Uh, I'm from San Francisco. I've lived in LA for almost eight years now. I've been making electronic music since I was 14 or 15, and I've been doing it professionally for six years now? Something like that? Five, six years? I've been touring for four years, I think. So, a little bit about me in my early years. These are two of my favorite pictures I could find of myself when I was a wee young boy. Um, I think I'm like 13 or 12 over there in my uh, metalhead days, and then that's my first DJ show I ever did in my entire life. Uh, I want to say I was either 14 or 15, DJing on a little tiny controller for about four people. It was like my you know crowning achievement back then. I thought I was really, really cool. I think that was my profile picture for like three years, probably. Um, so yeah, and then here's, here's I, I like these two pictures at the bottom because it kind of shows that nothing has really changed from the time that I was like 14 years old and that picture was like six months ago. Um, so no matter what you do in life, never change. Be the same person you always were. Um, so like I said, I grew up in San Francisco. I started playing guitar when I was 12. And like I was 100% convinced that I was going to be in a metal band. I don't know if you can tell, but I was like a metal fucking punk. And I thought I was super cool. Uh, but yeah, I was super convinced I was going to be in a metal band and tour the world in a smelly van. And I was super stoked on it. And I didn't even know what dance music was. And then um, I want to say when I was 14 or 15, which is pretty young to be seriously considering what you're doing with your life. But at that point, I was like, I'm a professional. I'm doing this full time. So I tried putting bands together and everyone's 14 or 15. So they're just finding out about girls, about, you know, things like weed or, you know, underage drinking, which I don't condone at all. Internet. Um, but uh, yeah, so it was just really hard to keep a band together and you know get people as focused on music as I was trying to be. And then I was in school one day and I saw this kid making beats on his computer, like hip hop beats. And I realized that I could do that, but you know, at first I tried recording myself as a metal band, you know, and I was like, cool, I'll play guitar and I'll you know, program drums and I'll do it all and I was horrible at it. I was really, really, if you've ever tried, it's like the hardest thing of all time. I think still now, knowing what I know with production, I probably still couldn't do it at all. Um, and then I had a couple friends, really good friends of mine that actually were <clears throat> producing electronic music at you know, 14, 15, 16 years old and they kind of were like the gatekeepers for me and showed me the world of electronic music and I was like, okay, cool. I don't know anything about the music at all, but like, I found out about dubstep, and dubstep and metal are super close to each other, and I was like, cool, it has the same energy and vibe, and most importantly, I can do it all by myself with no one else helping me, and as long as I work super hard, maybe eventually something will happen. And I guess, considering I'm standing in front of you guys talking now, I worked pretty hard, or something worked out, because I'm here. Um, and I think that's probably enough about that. <laughs> um, but yeah. So, how did I get there? Um, I think the most important thing that I have to say in this world is about failure and people telling you no. Um, I think 
there's and you know I was I was a uh, a big proponent of this myself especially in the early years but I think a lot of people try to and it's not your fault if you do this but I see it all the time people blame external factors on why they're not getting successful you know uh, corrupt music industry everyone knows everyone you pay your way in blah 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 whatever and in reality you just have to get told no enough times and fail enough times that you realize that the problem is yourself. I went to school, whether I had school, whether I was already graduated, whether I hadn't started yet, and I was there from like 10 a.m. to most nights 4 a.m., 5 a.m., 6 a.m., and I lived in Marina del Rey, which was a 45-minute, 50-minute drive with no traffic, maybe a little bit less, but I was getting like two hours of sleep a night, which is not healthy. So, you know, I'm not saying that you should do something that's unhealthy, but the fact is everyone around me who I saw working at that level, whether it was Nightmare or Kezo or Slander or any of the guys that have come out of the same school as me and done really incredible things, those were the guys that I saw at school every single day when I was there. I committed to, you know, not going out, not going to parties, not trying to hang out with girls, like not do anything and just work and try to get to where I wanted to be in life. And, you know, and this is kind of a shitty thing to say because, you know, obviously now I'm married and I understand what it is to have a relationship and a person that, you know, depends on you or you depend on. But a lot of people that I knew who had really incredible talent just like couldn't make that full commitment to working every single hour of the day, you know, maybe the person they were with, whether they're still with them or not, would have been supportive of that, but I understand why a lot of people couldn't be. I mean, literally like shutting, and I still deal with this with my wife all the time because of, you know, when I'm in the studio and I'm working, like I'm away in my own place and you know, there's multiple days in a row where I'm gone for 10 hours, even though my studio is literally like, Divided like this, you know, like our bedroom's here and my studio's here, but like I'll go in there and I won't leave. But one of the most important things that I did before I ever put the name Jaws on the internet anywhere, did anything, is I had like 20 or 25 finished songs done. And because I wasn't worried about like, okay, I need to get the project done right away, I need to get the first song out, I need to get the ball rolling, I was like, okay, I have to take this time to make this huge business plan for myself so I might as well just wait until it feels right and really develop this thing and really nail in what it is I want to do while I'm also writing all this music, finishing it and putting it away for later. Um, so like the first, you know, five, six months of releases of mine were songs that I already had done and I wasn't worried about what the next release was going to be because I already had this business plan of like this song comes out Every, every two weeks I'm going to have a new song come out and they're all going to come out like that and it was all already set so all my creative side of my brain had to worry about was writing new stuff. Because the most dangerous thing, and again I deal with this every single day, is worrying about writing a song that's going to be your next big single. You know, It's like the worst thing that you can do for your creative brain. And I know we're talking about music business still um, and I'll get to the music stuff in a little bit. Um, but yeah, the, I guess the moral of the story is like, you can never be too prepared. And like, just because, you know, one thing is hot right now, or you feel like you have a couple really good songs and they're gonna, you know, not be relevant in the next three, four, five, six months, like, it literally doesn't matter. Like, the longer you wait, the more prepared you are to like attack your project, attack your business and I guess attack the music industry, you know, in like the most effective way you can, like there's no reason to not wait as long as you humanly can. You know, it's, this, it's the same uh, concept that Mo and I, at the beginning before Matt, my agent, was even in the picture, it's the same thing we did with shows. When Feel the Volume came out, and people were playing it all over the place, and, uh, you know, things were really starting to look up, we decided to not play any shows for like, and this was 
based on a conversation we had with another agent who's a really good friend of ours. And he was like, the biggest advice I could give you guys is to not play shows for eight months. And I still had no job. I had no money. I was, you know, like my roommates were paying for my lunches and I could afford like coffee and a pack of cigarettes in the morning because, you know, that's what I did back then. And again, not something I would suggest, but uh, yeah, it was like every, you know, two or three weeks I would get a call from Mo and he would be like, are you okay? Like, can you still afford to live without playing shows? And that was basically how we ran things. So we were patient. And like the second that we finally started playing shows, it was just like, like skyrocket. You know what I mean? And I, you know, I give this advice to people all the time, but it's like the more patient you can be, like, don't get me wrong. If you see the opportunity and it's staring you right in the face, you have to attack it. Right. But at the same time, like, you know, the longer you can hold off, and the better the product you deliver is, it's like, it's invaluable. Just because someone has done something incredible for a bunch of other artists doesn't mean they're necessarily gonna do the same thing for you. And especially if you're going out and looking and you know, just sending your music around and you know, <clears throat> not necessarily begging, but like hoping that someone is gonna like take what you're giving them, nine times out of 10, you're not gonna find the right match. Um, and I mean, I could go on about that kind of stuff for days, but I think the really important part to take away from that is just like, put out music on your own, manage yourself for as long as you can, and then when things are really going so well that you can't handle the load that's being put on you from a managerial aspect, someone's gonna come in and be like, look, I see what's happening here and I believe in it. And that's what you want. And that was the same thing that happened with Matt, our agent, is, you know, we waited on having an agent or finding an agent until the point where, you know, agents were looking for us. And you play it for a million people and they're like, wow, that mix down was incredible. But like, what about the song? Because there's like, there's no heart anymore. You've literally mixed the heart of the song away. So I would rather that my song sounds worse than other songs, but feels better if that makes sense. So like when I'm in the studio, when I'm mi mixing and mastering, you know, finalizing my song, I'll make sure it's, you know, a certain, you know, it's not too loud and it's not too quiet. And I'll, you know, compare it to a couple other tracks, but not, be not necessarily for how clean they are. But I'm like, I know this song, like when you hear it on a system, people go nuts. And it's not even because they know the song, it's because the song feels that way. And so if I can match that like energy and that feeling, then I'm happy. Um, that being said, a lot of this song not feeling right was because I had the mix sounding horrible. <laughs> so, you know, there is something to be said about, you know, knowing what you're doing technically, but I'm gonna shut up now and just play the song. And I haven't really heard it on these speakers. I don't know if you guys are like me, but every time, no, 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 it's not going to be too loud. It's fine. We have, we have people in the back making sure your ears aren't going to explode, but maybe my least favorite thing to do on the planet earth, which is ironic considering I DJ for a living is play new music for people like crowd of 10,000, 15,000 people is cool. You know, a hundred people sitting in a, a room staring at me while I'm wearing a uh, while I'm wearing a Steve Jobs headpiece. A little bit more uh, nerve wracking, but yeah. So this is the this is the single coming out on Friday. It's called Get to Me. Um, it's a cool one. I put a lot of time into this one because I cared about it a lot. I, I think it's a good one, and hopefully it plays. Hopefully it plays. Okay, no, that's right. Going along, life up the road. It's just a little fears. Don't let them bring your tears. Hold me down or help me out. Or watch me turn to hell.
project because it's gone through so many iterations that like and I feel like I've deleted most of the stuff but like I feel like there might still be some some old goodies in here somewhere um, I mean I did everything on this song from super super simple stuff that you know everyone knows how to do but no one really applies to a lot more complicated stuff so I'll try to touch on a little bit of everything right now um, one of the, ironically, most difficult parts of the song was this swell at the very beginning. Unfortunately, that was the point where my battery died both in my camera and in my cell phone. At the end, there was a pizza party with sodas, coffee, and of course pizza. And after that, there was a meet and greet. And my way back was a little bit adventurous, but I got home at 11 p.m. and I guess I'm satisfied with the outcome. So that's it and see you in the next one. Bye. With sodas, coffee and of course pizza and after that there was a pizza.